I'm James Milan. Uh, as part of our series, Your Arlington Dollar, which is an Arlington Public News series that seeks to clarify uh, the flow of dollars in and out in our town, um, we are very pleased to welcome back to our studio one of our favorite guests, Town Manager Adam Chapdelaine. Adam, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. Um, and Adam is going to be guiding us through uh, several of the tools that are available for any uh, Arlington citizen to better inform him or herself about the town budget and the different aspects of where our money is going, uh, as well as where it's coming from. So, Adam, uh, I understand that just recently uh, your office published, as they do annually, the financial plan for mm -hmm. the town. Correct. Um, and I would first ask you to describe, well, what, what does it contain? What is it about? Um, and just kind of take us through um, uh, the, the, that part of the process. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you again for having me. So, uh, as you said, James, the financial plan, which is this document right here, this big, thick, uh, honking Impressive. document, yeah. uh, is the town's annual financial plan. And it's really the culmination of the better part of six months of work. We start the operating budget process in October of, of the prior year, and we begin to work on both the numbers and the narratives and the policies that go behind the budget. Uh, and I think policy is an important word to state because a lot of times when we think of policy, we think of things like the leaf blower bylaw or certain restrictions or allowances here or there. But I really think the biggest policy that the town adopts every year is its budget because it says, here's where our priorities are, here's what we're funding. And that's what we try to get at in this financial plan. We provide department by department a narrative of what we're spending the money on, what our objectives are for the year, and what we've accomplished in the years past. We give org charts. Uh, we give work metrics of the, what's been accomplished in the past year. And in addition to that, we try to compare ourselves to other communities. Uh, we show how we match up in eight different criteria, uh, different comparable criteria, in both revenue raising capacity and expense capacity. How do you choose which communities we're measuring ourselves up against? So when I first came to town five years ago, uh, my predecessor had put together a list of the town manager 20. And they were based on a number of demographic and financial uh, indicators uh, taken from the state's Department of Revenue. More recently, uh, my office, working with all the town unions, uh, did that again. We looked at <clears throat> basically revenue capacity of the town uh, and other different demographic indicators of the town, and we came up with 12 other communities that we compare ourselves to. Uh, so we call them totally the Baker's Dozen or the town manager's Baker's Dozen because it mm -hmm. comes out to 13. So that's what's in here now. And we look at uh, new growth, uh, how much new property growth or property tax growth can come to the community every year and compare ourselves there. Uh, we look at uh, taxation as a percentage of household income. Mm -hmm. We look at spending per capita, among some other metrics. And we try to demonstrate that, you know, Arlington has what is a pretty limited ability to raise new revenue and comparatively does not spend uh, that much money per capita compared to its comparable communities. So, so these again, just to clarify, the communities that you pick, these ba this Baker's dozen, are meant to be closely comparable to Arlington, or are meant to represent the the, the total diversity of possibilities in the state. So these are supposed to represent uh, things that are similar to Arlington, okay. or communities that are similar. We also include in any of these analyses statewide average for each of the metrics. So that will give you sort of the, the broad number for all 351 uh, in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, we do, we do try to show, um, you know, and no community is exactly alike, but we do try to compare to communities that are similar. Uh, some are neighbors, some aren't neighbors. Most are generally in uh, the, the metro region. Um, and, you know, North Andover is in there, uh, Reading is in there, but Medford is in there, Belmont, uh, Brookline. So <clears throat> some based more in density, other on their you know, uh, residential versus commercial uh, tax base. So there's a number of different factors that got somebody into our comparable uh, queue. Mm -hmm. And is there a sense that in doing that, that what we're trying to do is, is, is give residents uh, of Arlington a perspective on where Arlington is or how well it's using its resources or how well it's dealing with its particular challenges, that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important for us to show our revenue limitations so that we can express our structural deficit. And that's just simply to say that within our five and a half square miles, we don't have a lot of room to grow. Uh, and a lot, of the, um, a lot of communities in the state balance their budget annually with new growth. So you can raise your property taxes up to 2.5% a year, 
And really the rest of the money has to come from new growth. Because we're so built out, we don't have a lot of new growth. So that's the, the difficult part of the revenue equation. So we want, to, we want to show that. We want to show our limited new growth. We want to show our density. And that's some of the stats we show. And on the other side, we want to show that comparatively, we're, we're not just spending inordinate amounts of money on services. So that's what we, we do try to show that balance that says we have structural limitations and we are doing our best to spend your money effectively and efficiently. Okay. And so uh, you were saying before that it, it is it incorporates, I assume, the numbers from the budget and then adds in narrative it around does. all the different departments, including where we're at, where we've been, and where we're going. Is exactly that, right. Is that right? So what's contained in each of the departmental summaries is both a retrospective look at prior year's adopted budgets and then what the upcoming year's requested budget is. So in this book, uh, so this is for FY16. That would start on July 1st of this year. So you'll see requests for FY16, budget for FY15, and actuals for FY14. So you'll get to see year over year <clears throat> what we have spent, what we budgeted last year, and that we're asking for this year. So it gives you a decent comparison. So we'll show you by personnel services, or basically salaries and wages, then by expenses, a breakdown. And then we'll also show in a different chart the number of full-time equivalent employees we have in each department. So you can really look at a number of different areas to show where priorities are and where funding is being placed year over year. So. With that description, I think I understand a little bit about how you can <laughs> have a, a document that runs to 200 plus yeah, pages yeah. in order to be able to encompass all that information. If people are looking for something, you know, not quite so meaty, um, there are other options, I assume, for getting a sense of where of where the town is at. I think you brought yes, there, there definitely the definitely size version, <clears throat> and it's um, you, you know, I, I like to think of it as a layered approach that uh, most people are very busy. Uh, they might be interested in how the town spends its money, but they don't have a lot of time to dedicate to reading a 220 plus page document. So uh, four years ago, we created this document here. It's called the Public Annual Financial Report, or we call it the PAFR for short. And it's simply Very four catchy. pages. Yeah, <laughs> we, we took it from the Governmental Finance Officers Association. So we, we didn't make it up, but it really just gives you a very quick rundown. First page tells you about Arlington and its makeup and how it's governed. Second page gives you a breakdown of where revenues come from, where expenses go, and then a year-over-year -year look at that. Third page breaks down what is actually in your tax rate. Under that shows where our capital dollars go, and on the back sheet shows a snapshot of some of those comparable communities uh, that we discussed that are contained in the financial plan. <clears throat> so it's probably you know a 20-minute read, and it gives you a pretty quick and clear picture of where we stand financially. Yeah, it sounds like it, it really does. I mean, this series in general is exploring many of the, the, the issues you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, we'll, we have the opportunity to delve gr into greater depth than might be covered in a four-page document. But nonetheless, as a, th as a synthesis of all of this information, getting that into four pages and in the way that you've described it, that's impressive. Yeah, we're, we're, we're proud of it. It was something the Finance Committee uh, chairman, as part of, I believe it was the town reorganization committee some four or five years ago said, you know, the town should put this together. So they tasked the town manager's office with it. I was the deputy town manager at the time, and we started cracking away at putting something together, and we issued that first one, I think, in FY 10 or 11, and we've been doing it ever since, and it seems to get positive reviews from the community. I know that there are other things as well, other tools that you came here to let us know yeah. about. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to invite you to tell us about another one. So these two documents here are clearly very helpful, I, I think they are, but they're also static. They're, they're just documents to read through. So sort of the next generation of what Arlington has uh, put forth are online tools that are active, ever-changing tools that you can interact with. So the first one, I guess, to mention would be Arlington Visual Budget. So we released that in 2013, and that was part of a collaboration between uh, Annie LaCourte and Alan Jones, members of the town manager's office, and Involution Studios, a private software design firm who's located in Arlington Center. Uh, so those three parties came together over the course of about almost a year and built Arlington Visual Budget. And it's a very interactive, uh, graphically based tool that anybody can go on and take a look at where your tax dollars are spent. Uh, you can look at where revenues come in, and then you can look at where it goes. And what I think is the the, the the coolest feature is you can put in your tax bill. You can put in the average tax bill, you can put in your tax bill. And then you can look at the breakdown of what you spend on each department in town. And it quickly shows you, at least in my opinion, that for the most part, you get a pretty good deal if you actually look at it service by service. Even for me, reframes your perspective 
-hmm. on the costs of delivering government services on a sort of a per capita or per household basis. And, it, and you could never hire private security or private snow removal for that kind of price. Is so, this is the visual budget something that uh, you know is a is a common uh, um, kind of tool or or uh, you know do do most towns have this kind of thing for their citizens to be able to access and and and, and interact with in this dynamic way to get this that that personal a sense of where their money is going. So I my answer would be not yet. Uh, Arlington visual budget was a one of a kind. Arlington visual budget was the first of its Is kind. Is that right? <clears throat> Involution, you know, they, they piloted it and they, they created the back end. Now, there's some other versions of similar things that some larger governments across the, the nation have put out. Uh, OpenGov and Socrata are a couple other companies that have not exactly similar, but at least similarly concepted uh, products. Uh, however, I, would, I really hope that more communities follow this visual budget model. And I know that the group <clears throat> that I mentioned earlier is now trying to work with other communities to bring up other visual budgets in Massachusetts. Because I think the real power would be able to line up community by community and start to do some comparisons uh, in terms of those expenditures. Because even though I say it sounds like a good deal based on your tax dollar, you don't know if we're efficient based on that. But if you looked at us up against Melrose in Medford and maybe Belmont, then you can start to see a, a clearer picture of how your community is actually stacking up in the spending of the spending of the tax money. Mm -hmm. And and in terms of the visual budget, uh, it contains a lot of the information that you've already described. I, I, I'm I'm sure. Does it do much forecasting forward of where expenses are going or? Uh, you know, basically just a, a vision forward, because that's something that I'm not sure is contained in the financial plan. I don't know if the financial plan for FY16, as you mentioned before, stops at, at that point. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering about people being able to get ideas for where, where things are headed. So actually, the financial plan and Arlington Visual Budget do project out. They do. And they tie into the long-range plan. So the town has a long-range plan that always looks five years ahead. So right now we're projecting out through FY21. So in this book, there is that plan. So it shows you year over year what we expect both revenue growth and expense growth to be. And in Arlington Visual Budget, you can look at the same. So you can see the trend lines in various expenses. And they're all programmed. So there's, there's not, in the plan, there's not many surprises. But you can see if there's any assumptions we're making where things might dip down or dip up at a, at a rate higher than expected. Mm -hmm. So really, the, the core of Arlington's financial management is based on that long-range plan. And I think that was first started back in 2004. Uh, when the first operating override as part of these long-range plans was put together. And it's continued for the better part of the past, uh, past decade. And it really it brings together town leaders, school leaders, and gets everybody, if, if not very happy, on the same page about how we should be steering our financial ship. Mm -hmm. And, and, and move it, looking out five years in that way, you're saying that the, that the, 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 the financial plan incorporates that n new year data or new year's projection each time. That means, I guess, that four of the five years have already been covered um, in, in a previous financial plan. Uh, is there a consistency in those numbers, basically, as, as you move through financial plans? In other words, are we finding that those projections, um, as encompassed within these financial plans, um, which are archival documents, right, yeah. are we finding over the course of time that, that they're reasonably accurate, that, that, that those, you know, that, that there's not that much change. Um, so I would say the things that we have control over, the projections have been accurate. So school budgets, town budgets, items that we weather. can. The <laughs> weather. Yeah, we, we, we wish. <laughs> um, we, can, we can control those things, and we put um, caps on those spending uh, areas, and we hold to those. So we either do up to those spending caps or better or below. Items where we don't control the costs, health insurance um, or revenues from the state, uh, you know, those we have done somewhat well. We've been a little conservative in our projections. So over the past four or five years, we've actually done better than we projected. So you'd see some areas where we projected revenue low in a conservative approach and have done better. And ultimately, I'd say that's a good thing because mm -hmm. uh, it leaves us in a better position. Uh, so I, th I think the short answer is the things we can control, we hit them right on. The things that are out of our control, we try to be conservative. 
And I, to, to date, we haven't lost on any that, I, that jumped to mind, which is, that's my baseline approach. Yeah. Let's not put a number out there that we're not gonna meet. Um, you know, you don't wanna hide money or be accused of, uh, you know, under inflating something uh, too much, but at the same time, under inflating is always better than over inflating, because mm -hmm. if you over inflate, you're gonna run out and, and have a problem. Right, yeah, I mean, that does sound, I have to say, very reassuring um, in general to know that we're hitting the things the targets pretty much spot on that, that we can predict and yeah. that we do have control over. And that the approach to the rest of it is, well, let's, let's go with what we can be quite sure about and then hope that there's a, a surprise on the upside if, if there's a surprise at all. Yeah, I mean, and, you so know, and the state aid has been the example. We're, we're still well below where we were before the crash in 2008, 2009 in terms of state aid. But because of that, we've budgeted conservatively and we've received more aid than what we had projected from the state. So it's a win for the community. And that's allowed more money to go into the override stabilization fund and thereby mean when we need to consider an override again in the future is pushed further out. So it's really a win for everybody. Okay, I had one more question about the visual budget and then yeah. we might move on to something else. Um, and you know, with the caveat that I understand that maybe you won't be able to answer this. Mm -hmm. It's a, re a relatively recent innovation and it is an essentially dynamic kind of document or interaction that happens between uh, the, the, ac the person accessing it and, and the data there. Um, are there things that you know, that you're aware of that are not contained in the visual budget now, but, but will be um, sometime in, you know, that we can, that we can uh, anticipate will be added in there because they've been identified as needs that have not yet been addressed by, by that particular program? Well, I guess I would answer that the biggest thing missing from Arlington Visual Budget is that it's just what it's called. It's just budget. It doesn't show you actual expenditures, and you can't dig down into any detail. So the other product, Open Checkbook, that I know we wanted to talk about, covers that. I'm not sure that we'd ever put it into Arlington Visual Budget, but you know, in a perfect world, I would love to see a marriage of those two products so that someone could be accessing it all from one interface. I don't, I don't know if we'll get there. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, you know, and if we did get there, it might take an investment that would not necessarily be reasonably supported. Um, but I, I would say that's, the, you know, that's what the budget doesn't have. The other thing it doesn't, Arlington Visual Budget doesn't yet have is that comparability. I, that's someplace I think we can get to. And I think that would be a very worthwhile Right, that will require other communities to, to, to get jump their on. own acts yes. together around establishing this exactly. kind of thing. Um, yeah, so you just mentioned Open Checkbook, which uh, I guess would be you combine the two things, the visual budget and Open Checkbook, perhaps you're going to get the ultimate in transparency there in terms of being able to see, uh, you know, any citizen being able to access direct information about where yeah. their money's going. But anyway, tell us about the about Open Checkbook. So Open Checkbook is, is really exactly what it sounds like. It is the town's checkbook. It's who has the town cut checks to and in what amount, what department has it come from, and what fund has it come from. Uh, so it's really, uh, I think, the sort of the penultimate in financial transparency. And it's been something that I've wanted to get online for the past couple of years. So we were fortunate to get <clears throat> to be part of a community innovation challenge grant through the state. Uh, it was an, <clears throat> excuse me, an already existing grant. Uh, we were able to jump on after the fact, and we worked with Tyler Technologies that provides the town's actual baseline financial accounting system, Munis, and they provide open checkbooks. So it's a direct link between the town's accounting package and this uh, online interface that citizens can access. And you can go in and you can look at, all right, how much did they spend uh, on a DPW supplies last year? And you'll go in and you'll see Pete's Tire Barn and Wheel Abrader, and you'll see everywhere that we bought parts, the amount that we spent, when it was spent, and what account it was spent out of. So you can, you can really dig in, and it's the actual money we've spent. So uh, on, you know, following up on that, um, besides the, the curiosity factor and transparency, which is no small thing, of course, uh, what's, you know, what is, what is it in, that's in residents' interest um, to having open checkbook? So I think it's all about trust. And when I talk to people internally, department heads, other employees, and then people publicly about transparency, often people will say, well, why don't they just trust me? Or why do we have to put all this information out there? I can relate to that. Government's unique. There's really no place else 
in our society where you know, there's this desire for everything to be an open book. So I think psychologically or societally, we don't necessarily, even working in government, always get it. But I've tried to get it, and I, and I think it is important. And the argument I make is you know, every community has people in the community that are going to call into question things that the government is doing how it's spending money, actions it's taking. And sometimes they have loud voices, and they'll stand up at city council meetings or board of selectmen meetings or town meetings or whatever your form of government is, and they'll make arguments. And if you don't have the trust of your community as a whole, that you've had an open book and that you've been transparent and that you know, information is out there to find, you might be in jeopardy when those people stand up and make those arguments. But if you've had the information out there, even if citizens haven't actively accessed it, if they just know that your government's transparent, and that information is provided, and if they ever wanted to find it, it's going to be there, I really believe that they're going to trust you and that you're going to win the day if you're being challenged by someone who's not coming at it from you know, the most reasonable point of view. So that, that's where the value is, I think, for both the government and the resident. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, that turns such a situation uh, as a person standing up and challenging in a very public forum, um, things that the government is doing, that turns that into a, a kind of um, healthy functioning of democracy. Yes. Yeah. Um, rather than a creation of you know, paranoia and distrust going back and forth exactly. between the government and the citizenry. So that sounds, again, like a, a good thing and another kind of reassuring uh, uh, point about the way that Arlington functions, which is, which is great. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Um, I wanted just to, to ask you, uh, is there anything that, we, that you wanted to, to, to discuss or to talk about or let people know about that we haven't touched on here today? Well, I, I think I would just generally say, you know, we have a very robust budget development process. Uh, it starts internally with departments working with the town manager's office. We then submit those budgets to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, in January, and then it goes to the Finance Committee, and they hold public meetings every Monday and Wednesday night, basically from the beginning of February all the way up to town meeting, where every single line item in the budget is debated. So there's really ample opportunity for people to get engaged and informed about the budget process in Arlington. So anybody who's watching, you know, who hasn't done that, I'd recommend if they're interested to do so. Uh, if they're interested in learning more, go to the website, pull down some of these documents, look at Arlington Visual Budget or Open Checkbook, and if you have feedback, Email me, call me, let me know, because we're always interested in trying to do a better job in providing the information that people want to see. Just in what's going on, in terms of the planning of your office and of, our, of town officials, uh, what's, what can you tell us about what's in the work for promotion of business, you know, making Arlington more, even more business friendly than it may be at the moment? So short term, coming out of this winter, uh, the economic development planner and the director of planning and community development are working on a small campaign to try to help out with the Chamber of Commerce to get just some uh, attention out there that we need to support our local businesses. So that's sort of a short term thing we're focusing on. In terms of becoming more business friendly in general, we need to work on a plan to upgrade our infrastructure. Because I think you know, our, our sidewalks and our roads, especially in our business centers, that's the business's front door or, the, or their, that's their front mat. So in East Arlington, there's going to be some disruption with the construction, but I think when we're done, all the businesses down in East Arlington are going to have a beautiful new front patio uh, to welcome their clients into. So I think that's a key part of what the town can do, provide friendly, pedestrian-friendly infrastructure in the business centers. Uh, the next big project coming up after that is the Arlington, Safe, uh, Arlington Center Safe Travel Project, which is going to better connect the bikeway uh, in Arlington Center put bike lanes in there so that it's very clearly delineated where bikes are supposed to be, where pedestrians are supposed to be, where cars are supposed to be. Uh, and as part of that, there'll be you know, a little bit of upgrades to the infrastructure. Moving forward from that, uh, myself and the Director of Public Works often talk about um, you know, Arlington Center being the next place that needs a facelift in terms of sidewalks and roads. So that's something that's still in the planning and discussion phase. But uh, overall, I, I think that's the best thing we can do, is provide businesses with solid, clean roads and sidewalks to welcome their customers in. Any, any possibilities, any movement around public trans, you know, increasing public transportation possibilities? I'm not talking about extending the T into this area or things that we can't control necessarily, but just within Arlington, any kind of anything that would make it easier for people to move through the various commercial centers of Arlington and from one to the other. So we, we were working with the Route 128 Business Council for the past several years, and they're the, the group, the, uh, they're a transportation management agency, and they're the group that runs the shuttles out of Alewife up to the Route 128 corridor, bringing people you know, sort of in and out of the Route 128 belt back into where they live in 
whether it be Arlington, Lexington, or in the city, if they get on the red line and go in. Uh, but they have transportation expertise. So they came in and they, they did a public survey, an analysis of uh, where people you know, come and go in Arlington, and they couldn't really come up with a recommendation for a shuttle service that would be cost-effective or beneficial, but <clears throat> they did put on our radar, and it's something I think is contained within the master plan, uh, a goal to take a look at whether or not Hubway or something similar in terms of bike sharing would work in town. Um, they also uh, promoted us taking a look at ride sharing, which is still sort of an idea that's out there that we haven't moved on, where basically it's, you know, you, you informally organize with other people in the community who are going in the same direction as you and have locations where uh, you can meet up that with them and happen. get a ride to where you can go. A little dicey for the town itself to get involved with in terms of potential issues of liability, but it's something that's happening in other parts of the country that, um, that I think Arlington is the kind of community that could consider something like that. Well, I know folks that I know have, have, have wondered why we don't have some kind of shuttle service, so it is interesting to know that a you know, a group of professionals and experts came in, looked at the situation, and determined that it just it wouldn't make sense at this point. At least, at least for commuting, uh, I'll say. Uh, you know, in terms of moving people just around town, I suppose there's more work we could do to take a look at that. Lexington's got a great model with Lexpress. Right. Uh, but I do believe they subsidize that with tax dollars, so there's always that back and forth of, you know, where are you going to come up with the, the extra revenue to support something. So uh, there's still more work we could do in that regard. Okay. Well, I appreciate your going beyond the scope no, of please. what we were here to talk about today. But of course, we did also cover quite comprehensively this, this suite of tools that are available uh, to all Arlington residents, thanks to the kind of smooth functioning of, uh, of our town government at the moment. And uh, appreciate, I uh, want to congratulate you on the release of, uh, of the financial plan, which was to be a huge thing. Oh, and it's absolutely a team effort. I should have led with this. The deputy town manager and the management analyst and the whole office and the whole team are to credit for this. So that's, that's uh, it's really, it's, it's a thanks to, to many. Okay. Adam, I was wondering uh, whether there was anything as we are uh, heading into the beginning of town meeting, whether there was anything that you wanted to point to or highlight among the Warren articles or uh, the business that is going to be taking place. You know, I think the number one article to point out is the resolution to endorse the master plan. So master plans are officially adopted by the community's planning board, which here is the ARB or the Arlington Redevelopment Board, and they've already adopted the master plan. So the plan itself is adopted, but we all think getting town meeting to actually endorse the plan is a very key step. And it doesn't mean that town meeting saying everything in the plan that they agree with it, just that they agree with moving forward with further considering the recommendations of the plan. So I think that that's the key one. The master plan is a very comprehensive document, and it's going to provide guidance to things that we're going to pursue over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So I think that's the number one warrant article to tune into. Certainly makes sense that it would be, given that um, the devil will certainly be in the details Absolutely. there, right? Because you'd need the endorsement. I would assume, or it would be very helpful, have the endorsement of town meeting given the fact that next steps are implementation of the goals that are set up in the master plan, and that's where you really have to get buy-in, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely right. Okay, well, thanks, Adam, so You're much welcome. again for coming in. It's always elucidating for all of us. My pleasure. Uh, appreciate it very much. Um, thank you for joining us for Arlington Public News and your Arlington Dollar. This is James Milan, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.